Hello, you are listening to the show about ideas, ideologies and their inherent contradictions. A set of dialogues with some of the most exciting people in this politically charged time. This is Sudeep Tomandal and you are listening to What's Your Ism? I'm an atheist in the same way as I'm an a leprechaun. Why have there been casteism existing in the country still today? Feminism, by definition, is the belief that men and women should have equal rights. So the nature of the system is to be as mean and rotten as you can uh, to try to maximize profit. This is a podcast of the News Minute and you're listening to What's Your Ism? Hello and welcome to What's Your Ism with me Sudeep Tomandal. This is a show where we explore the ideas and ideologies of the most exciting public intellectuals of our time. Today we have with us a very prominent left thinker. She's somebody who opened up a new battlefront for the left by launching conversations around gender, sexuality and feminism. In doing so, she not only challenged her own comrades on the left, but also got into heated debates with feminists and with queer thinkers. She has also had her entanglements with Dalit and Ambedkarite thinkers over questions of caste and social justice identity. Um, Kavita Krishnan, former Politburo member of the CPIML, the Communist Party of India, Marxist-Leninist. Kavita, thank you so much for joining us. So it's great. I mean, I'm so happy uh, for one thing to be here speaking to you, of course, but also uh, the the uh, title of the podcast sounds great. <laughs> yeah, I just thought that there's so much that we have already debated about, argued about in the past. And I thought something can anchor it down and where we could look at just ideologies, isms. Uh, so I'll open straight up with that only. You talk about often in the last year that I've been following your work, you talk about uh, re-examining your certitudes. That's a word you like also a lot, no? Certitude. Uh, what is your present certitude? What's your ism now? So I actually um, have, you know, when I knew the, when I heard that you're going to be uh, doing a podcast on this topic, I really thought uh, it's a useful, it's useful for me because I'm at a moment when I'm actually thinking that the uh, various isms of the past century, 20th century, don't, uh, don't really serve us now. So they are at best, you know, if I say Marxist, it's at best a sort of placeholder kind of thing. So it, it gives, uh, it can give someone a broad idea of where I'm coming from and what my concerns are. But it is not a doctrine. It's not a set of, uh, you know, firmly, you know, uh, you know, uh, well, well argued out positions on everything. And I think that that should go for almost all the things that uh, we consider to have been the isms of. So I think that in particular about myself, because I think that uh, the 30 years of uh, political activism that I had, it was broadly, as you say, uh, you know, a communist, Marxist, uh, Leninist kind of framework. But I think that uh, at the same time, uh, the tensions with, no, I won't even say tensions, but my concern used to be that I came to Marxism with a sort of uh, natural, you know, instinctive feminism, an instinctive, uh, you know, uh, democratic, uh, you know, humanism, something like that. So I came to it with uh, various kinds of. You know, I understand the instinctive feminist part, the in this instinctive uh, democratic part. I mean, do you, are you speaking about your location as a woman? Is that the instinct? No, not only that. I mean, I was in Bombay during the early 1990s. So that was when the terrible riots happened in Bombay. I had no, you know, no ism at all. But uh, it was a very formative experience in the sense the sheer. Uh, you know, rage and helplessness, which, you know, continues till date, the kind of violence against minorities. I did not have uh, an ism or a language to explain it, but I knew that that was, you know, um, insufferable. And that was something that was uh, a shift from the, you know, the, the 80s where I had grown up. You so, were in school, uh, college? Then? I was in a college in Bombay, in my BA. So that kind of thing, so the sense of, uh, so that was a very, uh, you know, it, it isn't like I had any ism or any way to But that shaped it. your instincts basically. Yes, and the idea of civil liberties, which again, it was not a word I would have known, but the idea that uh, an individual's liberty should not be invaded by the state. Uh, state power cannot have a right to, you know, go around uh, dictating everything that you do. And the sense that are dominant, you know, that you're as a community, people shouldn't be, uh, you know, lording it over other communities. That was a sort of sense with which I came to Marxism. 
so i think for me to you know my journey there was continuously to try and uh, find a way to articulate uh, feminist ideas and so on those two primary part. concerns yes <laughs> and those two primary concerns became your primary concerns it appears at the end of your journey with the cpi ml the reason i say that is because now we are talking about kavita krishnan minus stalin minus mao also definitely okay i mean but okay. that has been on for a long time see my in the ml i didn't come in thinking stalin mao lenin at all right but it did i mean it's a very it big part of the discourse in the party yeah but in the 90s i mean the reason why i joined student politics was because they were arguing against communal uh, fascism you know in the 90s and this was the one student group which was really creative in that which was taking on the hindi speaking abvp you know the ones who would be quoting hindi and sanskrit that people you know they were giving it back to them so that was the exciting part when joined for that for democracy and and then of course the ml's fights in bihar and all were very much about uh you know against uh, caste militias and uh, the ranveer sena fights so so that yeah. kind of thing was what drew one not the doctrinal things those came later and my understanding was always that ml as a party was not hot on uh, stalinism uh, at all so they were critical of stalin but very much part of the iconography of the party in, so in the party offices you yes, see yes. so i used to that used to be a, a lasting fight of mine where i used to say let's kindly get rid of these damn things i don't want them in the office so uh, some comrades would agree some comrades would help me hide a couple of the pictures because i said okay if some some of the elderly comrades very attached to so big issue it will become so i said look when there's spring cleaning happening quietly get rid of some of them so that stuff about stalin and this was where in your journey of 30 also, years many right from see stalin and all i came to the party dis, you know i had a uh, complete you see i grew up in a let's say in a soviet town okay so yeah, because yeah, yeah. Bilai still Bilai, from the no? soviet setup so there were some things that were positive we knew uh, people from the soviet union over there and some were uh, wonderful but we i also knew about the kind of uh, you know surveillance culture and the, you know so i had no love lost for stalin at all and uh, so that was right from the beginning before i joined so this uh, when did you start daring to hide the because i think it is a little hide the photos happened about 10 years ago let's see <laughs> so, so around 20 years into your journey one. see mm. the point is i felt that i had people who thought like me so there were i couldn't have done it or there were people who were saying yeah 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 so the idea was that it's just some oldies who are really attached to not now but then i realized that that's in a very general sense so even on the mark centenary i remember feeling so glad that uh, dipankar the secretary uh, he had given a speech on mark in which he had clearly indicated no uh, not mark mark said uh, bicentenary as well as the november revolution uh, you know the bolshevik revolution uh, anniversary so he had spoken about how uh, you know the stalinist legacy is uh, is a is a blot and we should be saying so so i was very happy but when it comes to the d- details i think that is where the devil was and i never realized which means that if you're not if you're not just going to say in general we don't defend it but when it comes down to what harm did it do and to whom then ukraine blew that up basically because yeah, then you have ukraine, to admit yeah. that the whole of eastern europe these were colonies of russia and then of the soviet union and the kind of uh, you know uh, if for a party which uh, in india is uh, fighting the battle of peasants and has done so from its uh, from you know the uh, late 60s for that to be completely oblivious to the fact of what was done to peasants in the soviet union and in china i think that uh, feeling that that unwillingness to talk about that and then to talk about the harm done because then you have to talk about how that harm affects now it's not enough to just say yeah yeah we don't defend it uh, let's move on you have to talk about how it is with us today and i think that unwillingness was basically what started uh, i do want to give, come back to this ukraine question and you know uh, but uh, given these things i mean fr- what we have discussed in this short period about yourism is actually things that have now in a sense got detached or you know things that you've left behind yes where are you at right now so i i'll tell you what the one thing which i give feel, me labels yes. and then let's break it down you know that's the problem as i said the labels are if i say democracy let's consider that a label i don't have an ism for it but i feel that uh, the instead of thinking about uh, you know the prefixes to democracy which is how we were trained in the left right so you'll have uh, people's democracy revolutionary democracy then socialist democracy and then whatever so i feel like those prefix a liberal democracy is capitalist democracy this that so i feel like just the prefixes are no longer meaningful 
it's like clothes that you've outgrown and there is really no point because those so what the way i feel scripturally marx is <laughs> leninist uh, yeah marx. so i feel like i feel a bit like marx who said look i'm not a marxist kind of thing because i think that in the name of these isms uh, the kind of arguments that are coming out now are worse than absurd you know some of them are dangerous but i think that democracy if you look at it then i think the idea is that for me what is important in india is something i want to be important always no which means that people should be able to struggle for a greater democracy so whether you call it class struggle or whatever struggle is the important word there okay so you can't say so struggle there should always be space for more struggle so democracy is not something that is a goal it's not just something that stopped there it's a process and it's a process that is alive only when people are actually part of it so the state cannot represent democracy democracy is not a regime it's neither a capitalist regime nor a socialist regime it's not a regime at all can you call it a, a, a certain principle principle and a certain yes. bureaucratic system no no so i would say that it is not a bu bureaucratic system elections are a part of it an important part of it but what uh, you know what kind of uh, institutions there will be and all you can have it's very important to have independent institutions absolutely press judiciary but tomorrow maybe there will be better institutions uh, whatever which will have other names or other but my point is that you see uh, it is a system where um, it isn't that a bureaucracy and the state this democracy is not represented by the state or any of its arms it is where people are able to include and it's always it's so uh, a large number of people getting together and demanding that you exclude other people from citizenship or from whatever that is not democracy so democracy is not about numbers it is about uh, people either demanding inclusion demanding dignity and that's how you see so i i have a problem with people who say and so that's my you know that's where i am now my passion right now is to argue with people who think that uh, whatever we call democratic principles oh you know these are all uh, sort of uh, western values western liberal values even on the left see right wing says that but left also we say oh you know how dare america talk about democracy what is all this so the point is yes america it has double standards but the democratic standard say the un declaration of human rights you can't say that that is only a creation of uh, you know all the uh, post world war victors of course that's part of the story but the point is that each of those principles and how they have been articulated and how they've been argued it's like india's constitution how you know the, it has taken a life over these years because people picked it up and said all right i'm going to defend my rights using this line in the constitution so transgender people have written themselves into okay, uh, gay people have written themselves into these uh, charters of bill of rights Oh, you know anywhere that's so, what I so mean. how does the ri left write itself into the present conversation around democracy the reason why i asked that is because some of the concerns you raise are today concerns of the entire opposition with all its texture and color and shape and all of that and in that sense if these are the um, real pain points for us that we are trying to address i mean the the, the uh, erosion of democratic structures institutions values how do we introduce a left so two things i think one is that i think first uh, you know let's acknowledge that in india there's a whole spectrum of very amazing struggles for democracy variety of them and the left has its own uh, you know uh, credit creditable history of that so having said that then what are you bringing to the table in a time when democracy is really in very bad danger so i what references can you yeah go back to and invoke and say that this is See, because well, I, even I, even the even the very concept of civil liberties uh, movement in India, okay, frankly, uh, that the civil liberties lawyers were people who came out. Uh, again, I'm not trying to slot them into a party or whatever, but definitely they were people who came from a. Uh, they came out to defend, for instance, the uh, you know Maoists and so on in Andhra Pradesh. They came out uh, in the wake of the Naxal Badi movement to say that even someone who is an insurgent, even someone. that person has constitutional rights so you know it, it seems uh, some judge asked uh, justice kannabiran uh, sorry uh, kannabiran no that um, the lawyer the kannabiran that what about you know you are telling you are invoking the constitution in support of someone who doesn't believe in the constitution hmm. so he said but uh, you think that uh, he is the one on uh, his ideas are not what is on uh, trial here 
uh, it is yours and mine so if we believe in the constitution we can only prove that by being uh, you know standing for those values irrespective of who it is applied to when i say you know what invocations you can come up with the reason i say that is because ideologies and we are discussing isms and ideologies have icons have scriptural influences have you know texts that you refer to uh, ideologues who you refer to so who, who like for example if you were to talk about okay, the, the dalit, dalit movement as such okay. you know there is a certain iconography there is a certain and that anchors it to its core beliefs so in that sense in the in in a I time mean, when I democracy is in danger so i i get you now so i think that in india for instance if you look at it uh, definitely uh, you know for instance if you look at the struggles of uh, someone like uh, ram nareesh ram or jagdish jagdish master in uh, bhojpur okay now these are these should be people we should remember and know a lot more about you should know i don't can you please tell us yes so yeah. for instance these are people who as young very young men so uh, ram nareesh ram being from uh, dalit background and uh, uh jagdish master being the uh, uh from a uh, obc background so this these were in, people uh, this was in bihar bihar so they were originally with cpm okay and they contested like in the late uh, 67 something like that so they uh, tried he tried contesting elections ram nareesh ram and badly beaten up by the feudal people and all of that so in that process then they decided okay we want to form a harijanistan so they actually on uh, 14th april they st- uh, took out a julus saying arijanistan and all of that from that idea then they got to know about it. it's not that the naxalites and the party ml came and said okay now you form they heard about this and they thought that sounds like a good idea and a more consistent idea than a separate uh, state for the uh, for the oppressed uh, people so then they start they themselves hunted and first didn't find Uh, cpi ml leaders were underground and by that time you know so they themselves formed the party there and i think uh, one of the very seminal moments was on 14th april they kind of declared you know that we are forming so that's an amazing legacy okay that should be owned up with both uh, both it has hands. A, it has an organic element yes. as well as an ideological layer on yes. top which is a marxist yes. and it's not see it's not a layer on top in the sense that i think both were organic, organic. so they thought through this thing and what they were looking for was a framework of liberation of genuinely an idea of uh, you know liberating society and that person i mean ram nareesh ram he of course uh, was an unbeatable mla in bihar lalu yadav himself is supposed to have said okay as long as this guy is there that seat is his you know the um, uh, sandesh seat is his you know so those seats basically were Uh, and they 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 paid a huge cost you know winning those seats meant that that is what triggered the violence of the ranveer sena etc so i feel as the and one of the struggles see democracy right to vote okay the whole of the 80s were spent in bihar by these people uh, fighting for the right to vote that the people should be able to dalit should be able to go vote without getting killed so the, the location f- of the voting booth yes, itself was a big all of that yeah. and you know you were literally so th- i f- now when i read about the uh civil rights movement in the us and uh, you know casting a vote and how that ca- cost people lives uh, african american people i feel as though the conversation which we have had you know there's so many there's there's an abundance of books about those struggles but when we talk about uh you know say ml or naxalite movement in india or even dalit movement in india whatever there's very little discussion of these very real struggles that took place which are uh, uh you know an imp- a huge legacy right and you know it's interesting you mentioned this because one of the things that has been said about the left is why are you talking about cuba why are you talking about russia and china when we have something uh, which is an issue in uh, vayanad or right. you know in kolar right. and if, if you'll allow me i told you i'll, I'll surprise you with a little thing so this is a section from a malayalam film okay okay where this these two brothers are fighting over their ism okay so me show you that big day mattadalla sambhavichathu germany ningal tagarthu pacha vietnam ile cambodia ile vadakan korea ile janangal njangal aaveshamana nee manasilaakki ivadatha kaaryam parayumbe endra antarashtrathilekku odunnathu manushinte katha ella eduthu onna nada international politics alpetti onnu ariyilla engu chalaka adu eduthirunno ariyillano choliki njan parayam hungary ile endu sambhavichu മൂരാച്ചി എന്ന് മുദ്ര കുത്തപ്പെട്ട് നാൽപ്പത് കൊല്ലം കുറ്റവാളിയായി ശവപ്പെട്ടി കിടന്ന നേതാവിനെ സത്യം മനസ്സിലാക്കി ജനങ്ങൾ പുറത്തെടുത്തുകൊണ്ട് ആദരിച്ചില്ല മനുഷ്യ ഇനിയും ചോദിക്കേ പറയാം 
You know, <laughs> actually, uh, I called up Dhania today in the morning, uh-huh. asking her for this clip, and she said, "Guess what? My brother went. I think there was a World Cup in Russia. Is it Bhuvan? Uh-huh. No. Ha. Uh, so he went with this Malayalam poster over there, saying, 'Don't talk about Poland.'" <laughs> <laughs> great, but, great, great. but the point of this is what I mean. The point is that sometimes the left has come under criticism for being a little esoteric to the point of being very distant and giving references. That's the reason I asked you I about agree. references, iconography. Yes, what are the yes. you know? Uh, it is both a joke and sometimes actually it is not a. Joke no, I, I and, get what you know, you're saying. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can respond to the localizing of ideologies. You know, give give references which are from Bihar, from pl- places where your party is strong, where the left is strong. But also that eye on the global scene is uh, very very important to what's happening in India. And the left, in that sense, has a distinction of you know bringing global issues and. into the public discourse in india talking about how it impacts us whether it was the lpg policies you know the fight against imf world bank policies all of those things so therefore in the present context why is it also important for us to not just look at what's happening in india but what's happening outside yeah so i'll tell you that i uh, on the left uh, it has always been very tiresome for me when there have been you know whatever some conferences or something where there's a shopping list of you know okay this place this place this place this place this is our position that that this is happening there that's happening there. give me an example oh, just you know you look at any uh, you know conference document of anyone on the left and the first part will be international situation and there'll be a long list of this is happening that is happening and this is our position that's our position i myself have done that i myself have written this stuff but i uh, for the last several years i found that that is really uh, you know it makes no sense to someone reading it because it's not telling you how they are linked together it is not telling you how it relates to you and for me the way things relate is very simple you don't have to be on the left for this the point is that you are people are fighting struggles here and people have always learned from struggles elsewhere not just learned from struggles that have one I, to- i i talked about people writing themselves into bills of rights and democracy so if someone has done it successfully somewhere else or before you either in the past or somewhere else in the world they have won something for you that that's a ground that you stand on and fight for instance i'm just saying suppose there's a gay person in uganda okay who is now criminalized or a gay person in russia by knowing that uh, people in even the us as late as the 70s and 80s and even 90s have had to fight these battles and then establish their humanity say that we are you have to count us is something they're going to draw on it's so it's simple okay likewise i mean i think for us in india the uh, knowing that there are other people fighting for uh see the rights of minorities here or uh, civil liberties here you know you it, it counts that people are doing it next door to you in china it counts that people are doing it next door to you in burma in myanmar okay how can you not look at those things and my point is that instead of thinking the mistake is in thinking including on the left i feel the left is doing the opposite now of thinking that these are all international issues on which we have to deliver some statement we are going to have a position we may argue about that position but it has nothing to do with us here which is one of the criticisms of your uh, yes. quitting the party right why are you quitting over ukraine yes so, so it's a very simple thing let me you know because that's what you quit to, yeah. I mean, because i'm i'm sorry I but mean. a lot of us were like yaar modi se fight karo tum ukraine ke upar bhai Perfectly. so modi aur ukraine ka yes. kya connection so hai? first i'm going to say that uh, you know to put it even more simply pehla to ye ki bhai you know for a minute uh, just uh, i think i would recommend a book here oh, i would really in- encourage anyone in india who wants to understand more about india and the modi government and how uh, you know fascist uh, hegemony is being built here should read a recent book about which came out in march this year i think called the z generation on fascism in russia and youth how young people have been radicalized and in russia and i read it on an every page i was like oh my god there's so much to read and understand about how one simple example i'll give you so the person who's written that book ian garner he has said that look uh, fascism today is different you don't actually need to be out there in a large fascist rally 
India, you still have physical rallies. But he said that's not the only way. A young person can join the fascist rally anytime, 24-7, by just logging on to their social media, by just watching a YouTube video. They are part of it immediately. They share it, they are a part of it. So the participation that fascism requires, because it's different from just dictatorship, because you are actively called upon to participate and do stuff. You can do it there. You're doing it there. So that's one thing and how that is done. It's amazing. And uh, so much else. So one thing is that, that uh, the feeling that you see Ukraine, it's not just about some debate over Russia, Ukraine and whatnot. The fact is that this is a fascist regime of Putin's, which is, uh, which has this, you know, that is why the Hindu, the Hindutvavalas here recognize it. The day after the invasion, they said, oh, Putin will form Akhand Russia, just like we will have Akhand Bharat. Okay. So it is that vision. And uh, because that has been Akhand Bharat is a fiction, but the Russian empire is a reality. It has really been there. So A1 understands that. So to understand that the Ukrainians are basically uh, being called, you're being told that if you don't identify as Russian, you don't, you're not worth living. Like the Muslims here are being told either you're Hindu or you're no one. Okay, you be Sanatani or you don't exist. You're not worth existing. So it's that's one big uh, factor. But beyond the ideological, yes. which is that these are comparative ideologies where yes. you're looking at how fascism grows over there, yeah. how it. Yes. The material so of two war, things, war yes. is made up of guns and bombs yes, and yes. Uh, money and capital yes. and land. and. So the huge thing is look at India's uh, foreign policy. So Modi government foreign policy was a pro-Russia one more or less where they didn't vote in the UN against the invasion. And they said, look, we have to do it in national interest because we have to import the cheapest oil, Russian crude, we're going to import. It's a fiction that US had any problem with it because March last year itself, US said we don't mind if India imports oil. Of course, they wouldn't because we were doing the laundering of the Russian crude and selling it back to them. So, you know, uh, so that they can also get past sanctions. But more importantly, this whole import of crude oil did not result in lower prices here. Why? Because the public sector oil companies here did not uh, benefit. They remained bound to other contracts they had previously. Who were the two companies which benefited? And I cannot describe to you the degree to which they benefited. Smukesh Ambani's uh, uh, Reliance uh, uh, and uh, Nayara Energy, which is an uh, imprint of the Russian uh, state company Rosneft. These both are Gujarat-based units. Okay, These both are based in Gujarat. Nayara Energy was purchased from Ruya, which was, it used to be the SR. SR was in debt. Okay, And uh, it was bailed out by this buy in which the uh, Russians paid huge, much more than the actual cost. Strange. Then you dig a bit more and you realize that prior to that, Indian PSUs paid much more than was needed for some shares in another Russian oil company. It's a long and convoluted... No, tell me, tell me. But the point is that the, the interesting part is, which Jairam Ramesh said in a, in a press conference, in fact, when he was talking about Adani and this Russian bank connection, he said, what is this where public sector units are overpaying for an oil asset? And uh, the whole thing is murkily mixed up with some Gujarat-based companies and some uh, businessmen who are close to Mr. Modi. Surely this is a question worth asking. He asked it there. But no opposition party except the Trinamool Congress's uh, Jawahar Sarkar, he has written about it and continues to write and send memos and letters to the ministers. But as parties, as a political issue, no one has raised the fact of why Ambani uh, made a killing. Like this is a making a killing over... Uh, Ukraine oil. And uh, if a government, if a prime minister is choosing a foreign policy that directly benefits his closest circle, okay, is one of his closest funders and all of that, is it or is it not a conflict of interest worth asking a question about? I think it's obvious that you should, okay. And yet no one has. So there is the crony capitalist aspect of it. And then yes. there is the capitalism aspect of it, which is, I suppose, something which makes... No, also arms. I mean, see, Russia is selling us arms. No, the reason a, I say that uh, is because you you spoke of some of the opposition uh, yes. you know, members. And, you know, many of them are votaries of this model, if not... if not. Uh, yeah, but you see, they are raising questions about... My point is that uh, even if we don't go there, see, they are raising valid questions about corruption. You can be you know, capitalist and still raise questions about crony capitalism, okay, which they're doing about Adani, no, they're doing that, it about no, but the, If you get into the fundamentals of the discussion, then it, and if you talk about pulling it towards the left angularity, that polar 
that poll uh, we are talking about how the economy itself is structured and how these things are facilitated by yes but i think that in my own uh, time of last uh, several months my eyes have been opened about how my own idea of how this world functions yeah. is very different from what i thought okay so i think uh, the whole so state I- ownership psus uh, no, nationalization uh, of major major you know uh, fundamental industries so i think the economic and the political and the link between them is something now which is no longer you know the best books on it are not being written on the left that much i can tell you so i would again recommend that people read uh, books of about one of them is this uh, series of books by this journalist based in wales i think called oliver um, bullo and his books are about london being the uh, the capital of oligarchs everywhere so all Lond- all of london is real estate bought up by oil oligarchs or dict- oil oligarch backed dictators from all over the world and they are all there so he says you see the houses there these grand house by the way ruya owns one now which he has been it has been sold to him by a oil uh, russian oil uh, state backed oil magnate okay oil oligarch so he says these are not houses these are house shaped bank accounts okay now my point is what what he is saying is that this is a murky world in which the whole world is linked it is not you can't then look at it as america versus russia as were america versus china it's a it's a whole economy and that has become the real economy it's not the parallel economy it is the real economy the so called black economy is the real economy now and it is one in which it is deeply damaging democracies everywhere and uh, these advanced countries are the ones who say we are peachy clean but they are the ones who are actually facilitating the whitewashing of all that uh, money and it's literally blood money in many places right so i think if you need to my point is if you need to understand Ad- adani and ambani you can't do it without understanding this uh, you know this whole oil oligarchy world and it's also about saving the planet okay oil ol- oligarchies are defend are destroying democracy they're destroying our democracy and they're destroying the planet okay and planet of course means the poorest communities the most oppressed communities are going to be hit first so for me all this is not esoteric talk it's literally life and death talk and in india we all know the importance of talking about adani ambani my point is the adani hindenburg thing has shown us that that conversation is not possible by putting a uh, shutting the window at the boundary of india okay so geographical boundary but i do have something else to add about the uh, anism now okay which i think we need to worry about so that is uh, again related to our struggle here so we know that in india fascism doesn't come and say okay i'm fascism okay it says that i'm democracy i'm decolonial i'm getting rid of india i'm replacing it with bharat okay i'm uh, going to uh, you know i i'm the genuine uh, son of the soil and they are doing it by saying that democracy is essentially these western ideas that's not democracy real democracy is where the majority has the say um and so it's our civilization we are the mother of democracy so our civilizational and what civilization yes but the point is india civilization even if you want to live, look for civilizational roots which ambedkar did which the un declaration of human rights but specifically says there's no one model so i am like why don't you go back even to the indus valley culture which is not just india but it is actually now being recognized that the indus valley civilization was a city civilization that did not have an hierarchy as far as uh, so they hunted high and low they kept insisting it must have been hierarchical because you know whether it's marxist or others if it if it had um, if it they had city who is hunting for the hierarchies you mean um, uh, historians on indus valley for ages they said we must be getting something wrong there must have been a class system but now they are finally realizing that class and gender and other social hierarchies were probably not not what so they are telling they're finding the story from the structures of the city of course not the language which has not been cracked but now it's largely being recognized that sorry there's no evidence of you know that kind of a um, vertical model where you had somebody living in palaces somebody living you know the city was not so i'm saying wow that's our common heritage of humanity if you want to say mother of democracy that's what your mother's telling you okay but that's not what you go back for you go back to say our uh, the khap panchayat in the village is my unit of democracy which is specifically something ambedkar uh, rejected and warned about in the dens of yes, uh, yes, superstition yeah so i think that 
that same thing you're seeing happening here is happening of course you know parallelly in so many parts of the world but it's not just that they are together speaking one language where they are saying that the idea of universal values of democracy the idea that democracy means voting the idea that democracy means the individual civil liberties will be protected minorities and unpopular groups will be protected these are all the language of the un they are saying this is all western rubbish which in the post 1945 order has been assumed to be end of history it is not and now we need a new order which is multipolar multipolar is the word they are using to say let each of us tyrants do whatever we like and you don't interfere what does that mean for people if a uh, uh, rohingya muslim they have no state if she says okay i have no state so i'm i don't exist no she can tell herself look at least in the international law okay norms i exist irrespective of whether a state recognizes me or not i'm born with those rights as a human being but if that's wiped out if demo, you know if it is said that rubbish that doesn't exist is that really going to be a good thing or a bad thing obviously a terrible thing so i think our fight uh, but these are they are not only it's not just notionally that these are matching they actually meeting okay so indians are uh, in uh, indian uh, people who are advocates of this i won't name names they are visiting they are attending conferences in china okay uh, russian uh, fascist this alexander dugin has come to india is meeting people he has written a article in the seminar believe it or not in 2019 saying modi's victory is an amazing victory for multipolarity because it is proving that uh, you know the civilizational values are triumphing over all this western nonsense and uh, uh, seminar it yes so how, how, yeah it published it exactly no, no, yes your eyes are popping <laughs> sure so did mine <laughs> so this is where my problem is that you see it's under your nose why in india do those fighting understanding the danger of the sang how come no one talks about this this man is here or publishing uh, you know articles in a reputed uh, magazine reputed journal and uh, left journal and, yeah. i don't know what left but yes i mean it is a uh, you know uh, they say we are going to give space to a variety of voices but my point is that without editorial uh, framing you're carrying that guy's article and he is literally saying that and he's come he's visited delhi his original his publishers orig, uh, english publishers were originally based for the first four years in goa okay so we should be paying attention because these link see we may uh, the, the they are having linkages okay uh, all the anti democratic thinkers for instance is america versus russia business trump and putin are best pals okay putin literally says look western elites are the problem the western people are fighting back for liberation for their sovereignty and who's their leader trump okay brexit is all liberation from you know all this um so i think that we need to think a little differently about the world and the people who are trying to frame the conversation in opposition to this discourse uh are your former comrades i mean i, that, I, I, agree. I that, yeah I agree because with you. I agree we, with we, we can talk about isms in terms of ideas also in terms of praxis in terms of what are Most what definitely. you're doing on a certain morning and if you ask me what the cpi ml must be doing this morning they must be organizing a julus somewhere uh, you know addressing a press conference elsewhere to address these very issues and now they are part of the india yeah. um, alliance so i ask you given that they are already out there on the ground fighting inch for inch no fomo don't you don't you feel like 24 is around the corner in bihar the party has a has been yeah, yeah. able to kind of really uh, push back on how many seats it can contest in uh, nitish kumar has made concessions yeah. this is an exciting time yeah absolutely uh, you don't you wish you were there no, i i am very happy uh, for all those things that uh, the ml is doing but for that matter i you know i really f- i'm a, and i'm very happy that the left and especially the ml is a Uh, has a role to play in INDIA i do think that you know uh, that kind of uh, di- di- diversity and the left's presence is very important to opposition so i'm all for that i'll be rooting for INDIA and in particular of course for the cpml if i'm uh, if i have any role to play if they would like me to campaign i would happily go okay that could happen why not i'm happy to go. i've already I'm, i i'm there so many of them are good, very close friends i mean these are lifelong friends 
so i'm still in touch with so many people call up from bihar i ask them how things are going so they say okay will you be able to come i said sure you make you know your once your campaign plans uh, take place anywhere you want me there i am i'm more than happy so i have no problem no, you will be happy but will the party they, no, accept I mean, you i don't i don't uh, think that uh, Uh, it would be a very big problem depending on whether i'm needed or not somewhere so my point is give me something more no but this is sounding all <laughs> little ha hum log abhi bhi dost hai lekin we are in talks some comrade is calling you from bihar what yeah, is happening are you going to talk, i uh-huh. many comrades talk let me put it this way that i think i do feel a degree of uh, i'm upset with the so my main difference and the uh, let's see the 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 uh, anger i feel is primarily at the feeling that uh, the young people in the party and the whole party as a whole it was a chance to democratize you are actually corrupting that sense of democracy when you say that we have to place india first okay uh, we why should we bother about what uh, who are ukrainians why should we bother about uh, you know whether uh, putin why is at the same time country? taking a position position the, is taken which sounds all decent but it was not because you see uh, you know the point is that you were essentially saying that okay we are with ukrainians but you know if it's america versus russia you know it is better for russia not to be destroyed the point is why is that our business our business is to support the guys who are fighting okay you don't say in palestine you still say from the river to to the sea you know palestine shall be free even though you know that that's probably a very very far cry you support the guys who are fighting you don't sit around saying in the real is real you know configuration you are not there no you are not a diplomat you are not a world statesman you are representing a struggle here you should be supporting struggles elsewhere instead bringing in this calculation means it's not just about ukraine then it means that you're not able to see the connections as i said you can't yes, see russia and fashion, and, so and, and here india. i don't know how i can how i don't think i'll be do, yeah. very good at representing your comrades yeah. but let's even say they would still say right mm. saying wo to fir bhi it's a foreign issue and right now we we are in the trenches in india this yes. is not a time to yeah uh, so i so, so where my, is your intervention happening so my right position now? was then i should say that yeah. i said it's very a i think it's very much about india i'll give a very taza example in a second apart from the ambani one which i did and um, so i had said look what's the problem even if you don't see it now maybe you don't see it now let me talk about it maybe as time goes maybe i'll see some of your point you'll see some of my point so i think there the problem became that you know uh, the idea that no no you know the, the it's a guided democracy kind of system communist uh, party thinking so if we decide this is not the time to be debating this then you can't debate it here go out and debate it that i feel has been bad for the movement in general and i find it uh, you know it was the it wasn't like this even in the ml earlier so that i can't explain i hope that changes if somebody is in front of me from ml i'll fight it out you know uh, to the nail but at the same time definitely if i i would i would be rooting for ml to win seats in uh, bihar i would be rooting for them to uh, you know their their movements to be successful now the example i wanted to give again it's a very simple thing if this guy dugin is writing that the whole world is in kaliyuga now which means that the there is an anti hierarchy liberal ideology which is hegemonic we have to overturn that anti hierarchy and i'm quoting anti hierarchy ideology must be defeated and therefore uh, you know kaliyuga must be corrected and the hindus have it right and they'll show us the way and he is someone who has links with every fascist movement all over the world and he's got a permanent seat on various you know university think tanks in china okay so he's a very very key figure let's not underestimate he's a key ideologue so he's traveling from china to russia and to india and not only that and yes. he's able to kind of find common ground not just here he is a big uh, f- uh, everywhere in germany in the whole of europe he is in touch with a whole lot of far right groups america there are uh, steve bannon and others they are but how is he getting traction in china you, uh, i didn't get he that he is on he is uh, the think tank's name i'm forgetting see that's the point of course he'll get forget the idea that china's left okay forget the isms as i said okay these isms are misleading <laughs> because socialism communism what nonsense you're locking up uh, muslims en masse okay you are banning trade unions okay you're locking up somebody uh, without you know our uap is bad no they have a national security law on which under which one guy who ran a blog secretly in which he exposed corruption scandals of the government has been arrested and sentenced to 7 years in prison his wife is saying because of the under that law 
the charges are not made public uh, so the details of what he is charged with are not made public what is the evidence against him not made public not made public there is no public trial he is only produce his lawyer is not allowed to tell anyone uh, so his defense is not public the only time she sees him in public in court is when the judge pronounces his sentence okay that's it so the wife herself has no idea what th this man is supposed to have done that is wrong for which he has been locked away and this is still better a lot of other people are not just being this is a law no they are using other places you just disappeared picked up and vanished maybe you will be produced another day so my point is that is come on i mean you are if you if any if anybody really believes in these isms if you really think you are fighting for a better tomorrow whatever you call it this is not a better tomorrow this is narendra modi's uh, dream theek hai uska apna sapna hoga ki main i should be able to do it this well yeah okay i should be able to have this surveillance state be able to lock up anyone at will where if there can't be the least room that maybe some judge somewhere will hand somebody bail you see so i think understanding that my only point is this that it's not these are not foreign issues uh, dugin is a popular guy there he is present he has a permanent he has a it's a very important uh, think tank okay Chi and china any think tank is government uh, approved and backed he has a permanent sitting seat there he gives lectures from there and uh, talks he goes there spends time there so i feel if a man who is represent who is the foremost international fascist thinker right now if he is talking about kali yuga which is our speciality okay it's our indian and uh, also sitting in china at the same time yeah so indian which is a left exactly so it's country. an indian it's an indian fascist speciality you know your uh, manuvadi thinking ka the idea of kali yuga is after all all that where the where the uh, caste and gender hierarchies will be upturned and where the shudras will rule and the women will be free this i'm quoting okay literally from which is that. what actually let's if if we can again ba anchor sure. it back to the indian context sure, sure, which sure. is that okay so this is what we are up against yes this formation india right uh, it is literally the rest versus that one the best in <laughs> of theirs you know which is in this case modi shah bjp and all of that it is this entire conglomerate this 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 galaxy of people who have come together uh do you think that the counter can really come from this formation to that larger question uh, because if you ask quite simply In, in what will happen in 24 elections that's an easier question to answer than will this formation be able to set a different agenda and can it question these larger politics see i think uh, i'm very happy about this coalition having come together because i feel as though at least the first step has to be that you recognize the urgency of something if you're going to think in the old boxes about how do i you know in the very uh, okay how does my family guy retain his little fiefdom or how do i retain my little state how many seats this that that will happen i'm not saying that's gone away but at least you know it is possible for a trinamool congress and a cpm to be part of the same coalition you know uh, frankly to me it's a small good sign okay uh, if derek o'brien shares a video by john britta speaking in uh, parliament i'm happy okay i think it's a tiny good thing okay but more than that i think that it's an pos it is the it is an opportunity and now what they will make of that opportunity i don't know but for me i think the real battle can be won uh, only when we really th think that it is not just i mean the electoral defeat is hugely important electoral mobilization of people people you know who there are plenty of people who don't want to vote for this bjp lot karnataka has proved that and everywhere you know that you know this is a country where it's not yet russia okay there is this is a country where a large number of votes are being cast for parties that are not the bjp so how does one uh, but yeah. uh, so the concern over here being sanatana the concern over here being this kali yuga conversations around those kind of ancient revisionist kind of yeah, things but right? a very modern usage now yeah oh, so, but yeah. it is great to kind of use as a metric to measure the different people in the opposition right look at the question of the sanatana thing and how different parties have reacted some have just kept quiet they've just saap sung gaya is that how you say it yeah 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 saap yeah. sung gaya yeah. uh, in the case of someone like a kejriwal he says no no i am sanatani only there is a stalin in the congress uh, some priyank kharge will speak but the rest of the congress will keep quiet uh, is it okay i mean can we just like let it pass and 
no, see I it for know. hey no. this is the texture of this formation it has different different variables uh no i well, mean, ultimately f- let's yeah. assume there something yes. happens and this these are these are fractions which can come together Mathem- mathematically you can really see them defeating modi right uh, but if that happens will this agenda get defeated no i'm saying that if that happens uh, you're on better ground to fight these things is my only point okay i think that you're up against a government now which is completely uh, it has no interest in it has no respect whatsoever and no fear of protests none my point is i never i mean the congress government or the upa government sorry uh, you know no love lost for manmohan singh governments and all but there were governments that were afraid of people struggles they were you fight hard enough and then they would say okay okay come and talk we'll negotiate we'll do this we'll do that you know good that's what that's what so when people say weak government hoga theek hai kitna weak prime minister hoga if it is Ra- Ra- rahul gandhi I'm or like, a coalition yeah, candidate whatever. anyway whatever so uh. i'm like yeah the weaker the better because the it it is uh, the state and the government being strong doesn't mean your democracy is strong it doesn't mean people will get uh, better in fact people know and actually people know this if you have conversations then you they realize also that we were heard when whether it's the tehsildar or whether it's the uh, mlc or the mla or the mp or the chief minister prime minister when they were afraid of what we you know that oh, they may lose our support or they may lose our votes i get what you're saying the drift of what you're saying if correct me if i'm wrong is to make an intervention in the interim because you've slid so far that forget setting an uh, agenda which is left or uh, radical to chhod do but like right now we have to make some interim measures to come at least halfway up no this even line the that left. we have d- gone down uh, yeah, and yes and no ha huh, huh, yes huh. and no okay huh. fine but then uh, let me ask you this thing which is that every time this kind of crisis happens where the whole supposed uh, you know all the forces of good come together yeah. you know uh, and they say that uh, let's put isms aside and let's work on a common agenda now what gets framed out and what gets framed in when these kind of compromises or these kind of negotiations happen negotiations are important for any kind of political this thing is the important question right so when you talk about fundamental issues issues of labor issues of uh, gender issues of caste absolutely um you know these are things which are which have the potential to transform society communalism minorities oh. rights us pe sabka sa sab so ho jata hai sabko these kind of things are <laughs> the you know basic fundamentals of uh, this thing but when you say that right now let's take an interim measure let's take uh, these isms out of the equation little bit let's see what common ground can be achieved suddenly you have a situation where you have a thakre sitting across with a kharge sitting across with a stalin yeah, yeah. um what is mamata's ideology i don't know she also by the way says i'm sanatani uh, what is but what are what are we giving away or what are we allowing to slide and what are we getting into the agenda part see i'm going to say uh, two things one of which uh, you know i'm not i i myself don't have very clear in my head so it might be a little uh, provocative but the first thing which i would like to say is that see i don't think it's about interim or it's not about a compromise or whatever see the point is everyone will have their uh, you know their and uh, i i don't see fights as being okay we are setting aside other things and so we are fighting now for the minimum the point is that uh, you need these uh, these uh, these uh, weapons in order to keep fighting that's all you are doing you are saying i will i am fighting but you are trying to take my basic constitutional weapons out of my hand and transform them into something else no i won't let you that's what is happening now for the ones who are really fighting for a better tomorrow now of course when you have such a coalition uh, different uh, organizations will have uh, their most of the parties i have uh, criticized very strongly for years now because uh, they don't speak about uh, muslims uh, even their own muslim leaders were arrested and put in prison under uap or whatever so there's complete mane saap soong jana to wahan really soongta hai um you know where caste is concerned sometimes uh, out of some calculation if someone feels it is in their favor also they'll do but where muslim rights are concerned everybody is like no no who muslim i haven't heard of them that's it okay eid iftar is one thing but our rights you know civil liberties of muslims gone okay so, custodial killings oh my god no one wants to talk about it. 
so i think that uh, the point is that the then the minimum uh, understanding now is not a compromise the point is you are fight that th those arguments will be there you are going to fight but uh, the need right now is an understanding at least that uh, something poses a far greater danger so i am a strong believer in the lesser evil thing i think yes, we have to yes while we kind of uh, you know go for the le lesser evil you know it boils down to simple conversations around who should be presiding over x meeting mr x and somebody says no not mr x it should be miss x yes and messers x or yes, yes. you know it, it should be, be a large collection of men on the dais on the dais okay. it should not be a large collection of savarna <laughs> men on savarna the dais the then dais. then you would put some women and then you will be like not savarna women huh. right all of that and somehow when you raise these questions they are they are dismissed as almost like fetishes like you are trying to create a bouquet on stage when we have an issue such as modi on our hands when we have this fascist regime no, to fight that, that is you nonsense. know because no huh. we, the, i know, it, no, I know it's nonsense but yeah, yeah. it is it has come up over and over again and let's say also in the time that we have known each other right i mean we came in touch during the rohit movement yes, by which time you were already somebody who had gained a lot of prominence mm. for your intervention in the uh, nirbhaya struggle and uh, all your feminist positions were very exciting at that time and then this huge uh discussion started happening post rohit around caste and things like that and it did come down to who is going to lead the delhi rally you know it, it, it simple simple things like, you know who is going to contest in the uh, hcu elections ah, yes, who is yes. going to contest in yeah, the jnu yeah. elections uh, this is a student movement so when it comes down to that then suddenly it's like ye yeah, acha speech deta hai this person should be the person then the response can be this person gives a good speech because this person has been standing forever and had the mic forever pass the mic became a became absolutely. an important absolutely uh, but i know, think that's so important right hmm. my point is that you see this coalition i see as a place which is not ruled by modi and shah okay and uh, sarsang chagalak uh, mohan bhagwat in the back this is a coalition which is going to be noisy messy people are going to do all this jostling they're going to say but it, it's also described as uh, savarnas fighting among themselves it's not only savarnas on please. this side and that side yeah but it's hardly only savarnas okay so that is i mean at least about this coalition one can't say so because it includes so many parties that are very much not uh, you know their leaders are not savarna okay so let's go through them no which are the ones we are why look at rjd look at samajwadi party savarna look at only, no? uh, tam, uh, Savarna, uh, you know, they're not. They have leaders. Dalit parties or not, tribal parties, yeah, no. Yeah, but there, no, no, that's true. But then the point is, if you look at the political spectrum in India, uh, there are very few parties, you know, which are uh, specifically parties that have an ideology that I will be led by uh, non-Savarna people, right? So that is that is a thing. But I think what I mean is that the kind of uh, how do I put it the. uh you know if you have the uh, dmk or the uh, again savarna so no? i know what i'm trying to in, say in, in terms of avarna savarna they are very much they are avarna, very much right? savarna what i'm trying to say is that you see the recognition that i i need the support of uh, you know non savarna people i can't win oh. this election with, if, without them as i said these parties all of them at least have that tiny fear okay they know by now that in fact it is the bjp which has managed to pull the rug from underneath them because of their own neglect of and that goes even for uh, bsp and all that because you have not thought about uh, you know the the wider the need to uh, mobilize around an ideology of liberation which is how the bsp started so the idea that a uh, 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 an imagination which says that uh, see the problem is that all all politics in one level has been that okay uh, in indian politics there's been very little even the you know the the thing the places where it opened up to be uh, more inclusive those have also those places have begun to close up and they've also realized that even a party like the bsp for instance realizing that uh, you know uh, the minute it becomes a representation game alone where mayavati herself will go and say okay uh, brahman samaj ko i am addressing so i am going to give uh, you know this much this much seats to brahmin to this to that the point is that game bjp played and like a master they played it and they outplayed her completely so i think that um, the realization which indian politics is yet to get that you need to forge a new vocabulary to even survive to change things you can't you know these these uh, you uh, this game the way it has been played till now uh, is now going to have only one victor at one at the end ideologically even if you manage to uh, edge them out politically 
but i think that when it comes to edging out politically anybody who is uh, standing for all the other things see the labor movement leaders the uh, movement anti caste movement leaders the feminist leaders nobody is going to be happy with what this coalition alone represents in terms of a maximal uh, you know vision of society but i think we all recognize and we are going to be rooting for it at that level to say that look as i said we want uh, we believe that some of this messiness some of this noise some of this jostling and even us you know heckling from below saying hello where are your women hello where are your uh, you know non savarna le- leaders on stage that's great and i think we all should be doing it not because not to say okay i'm jeering it you and throwing it aside and saying what's the point this is useless because they don't have people on stage the point is i can shout at you and say put people on stage and i can keep shouting my shouting at um, modi and shah is uh, perfectly useless because they are not interested in that even if they put people on stage or in their cabinet it is not it is for a very very different uh, you know it's for an agenda which is uh, harmful to everyone and it is and we know that you know so i feel that the co- you know, conversation about that really needs to happen about why our most marginalized and oppressed sections in india uh, all of them exploited sections whether it's working class whether it is uh, dalits adivasis women how is it that the bjp has uh, the as the sang has such huge inroads there why is it that politically your self interest is uh, you know you are in a way voting against your self interest because you have been persuaded that your identity as hindu or whatever uh, you know uh, let me quote a sentence that someone said to me modi na wo apna jaisa lagta hai so i said why apna jaisa here you are wearing you know uh, you know you are be- you are struggling to survive that man is wearing designer clothes every day and he has uh, he is living a a fantastic life and uh, there is no comparison but he is persuading you that the worst ideas that you have which you used to feel a little ashamed about you know caste uh, prejudice okay untouchability even among dalits okay they hum log na i can cook and all because i am allowed to be a cook because i am not from that caste which is beneath me which we all know you know that <laughs> graded so the point is that he speaks to that he allow, he allows you to feel that now i can be out and proud and be uh, islamophobic i can be an out and proud casteist and it's okay because uh, i'm important to this guy so i think that uh, we need to be a little bring a little more uh, you know uh, i want a political arena where some shame and shaming is possible we can each, each say But yeah, is that shame and shaming really possible? Can you really go up to? I mean, we've had this thing. Not a thing party, the, but I no, think. But, but the movement itself. Can you go to a CPI ML and say that hey, all your general secretaries have been Brahmins? When is your Dalit general secretary coming? You can go to a DMK and say fine, whatever you may say, Sanatana criticize it and all of that. But you are no but better than UP when it comes to. Dalit atrocities. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, um, when I mean, we we talk Dalit about Dalit atrocities. My God, <coughs> atrocities against women. I women, mean, no. I mean, yeah. caste-based yeah. killings. Or, so, uh, what I suppose BJ, the BJP has done so well is to create these tokens, right? Modi as a token of a the working class and b the so-called OBC, uh, Ramnath Kovin. you have murmu and uh, those placements are also an indication of the failure of previous political formations to 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 to, to do that right even as tokens or as uh, really people with any uh, value these communities have never really found any representation in previous uh, political formations right and they are perverting the game of what well, uh, i should I say game they are perverting the politics of representation but that perversion is happening because of failures that have happened in the past with parties who are so called progressive so called dravidian so called left you know so i would say that uh, why the uh, when i say uh, the pressure of see i think with parties that want to appear to be you know that appearing democratic matters somewhere genuinely also and somewhere uh, maybe even as part of your political identity i think that there it does matter okay so uh, i felt that about gender forever and always because i always used to be told you know i used to get very annoyed with these groupings which would say we are going to campaign for voting for all the women i used to say no i am not going to vote for uh, sushma swaraj i will not i will not vote for uma bharati don't ask me to this is rubbish see so it is not just i you see they, they are not representing 
the interests of women they are certainly not representing feminism they are representing a vi violence uh, against entire sections of people which include these oppressed communities right so uh, they are representing an active violence so to tell me that toma bharti is actually you know at least she is not brahmin okay she is this thing look at her such an earthy leader and all of that uh, leader hai kitni feminist hai kyunki yeah, that's, that's not the point that's not the point that's not the point the point, point, the point, the point is not to say that this is a sangi dalit or no, no, this no, is no, a this no. but the I, point is they have perverted saying. the logic of representation yes. why yeah. because so called progressive parties have not you yeah. know pursued the line of representation no, no, of, i i know yeah. i know what you're saying yeah. which is why i'm saying that why i feel i feel that with the parties which have failed but are uh, you know why i'm saying is the the pressure they are they are uh, open to the pressure is because when you go and uh, say these things then somewhere the need to for instance i'll just tell you, you just said ml see one thing is uh, fair enough general secretary is uh, not just up across all brahmin only all have been uh, but uh, if you look at the uh, you know i i have seen you know that the change in terms of look at all the candidates okay line say everyone again i have my complaint where are the women okay there wasn't a single uh even now ideologically and all on uh, gender per se uh there is a much better position but it is far from you know the comfort level is still very weak when it comes to feminist positions and uh, when it comes to uh, you know the understanding of gender as a uh, you know a spectrum and being comfortable with people having that's very very problematic but the point is ki bhai kam se kam is bar jo bhi candidate tha bihar mein these well people who won they represent a wide variety and in fact and that, those and lost. that is that is something that every party is now started saying yeah. okay you ask a dmk they will point to a raja you know you point to, you ask uh, congress they will point to a kharge now which is interesting because uh -huh. the question therefore arises so therefore modi did bring about a course correction among you is it no modi because no. this is not a, this is not no, a pre modi phenomenon no it was pre modi at least where uh, you know these parties were concerned i i believe it's a phenomenon of the early 90s it is a phenomenon uh, which preceded mandal okay it was a phenomenon which started in the late 80s and uh, which changed the uh, the the map so i feel as though we need to give ourselves also a little credit ourselves meaning the in general the whatever even the even the 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 obc assertion the these aspects of the left because frankly uh, the late 80s were where the lalu and ml and all were competing so i feel like that was an exciting time when that competition meant that you are competing to be more more representative you are competing to be more inclusive right that is where you are coming so that's great you know because that that's where pressure works so i think that the you know the the political uh, candidates winning and all that's when it started where with you know the ml candidates as a rule then had to be because that was your your so your leaders who emerged they also then became central committee members politburo members etc okay because they had uh, established themselves through as as uh, mass leaders and and it had to be them okay i can't go and be a mass leader in bihar is out of question okay so there's no question of me contesting an election from the ml because come on i would have zero traction whatsoever so i think that that did change and my feeling was even in the debate over the reservation women's reservation that's where i dis i deferred with uh, nivedita menon and all on this where they were saying that women's reservation is there to cancel out uh, obc reservation so i said that's not how politics works anymore if it's a seat delimitation can change things but if it's a seat which is skewed so that uh, there are only certain options which are likely to win then if a man was going to win from here from that community a woman will also it's they're not going to vote for the woman because she gives a good speech okay so that is not going to no, but I, in women's reservation you do believe in internal reservations in that i want reservation. that to happen huh. but i said that the way her point was that the whole idea of women's reservation that uh, she was saying that the opposition to it which came from the uh, samajwadi party and uh, to some extent rjd was essentially in defense of obc reservation and i had referred her to read the uh, parliamentary debates after the first uh, you know the very very beginning part so mulayam singh yadav was not referring any more to obc reservations he was not saying that i want reservation within reservation he stopped saying it in parliament his parliamentary speeches against it were all telling uh, mocking at the uh, bjp and uh, congress uh, apakas leaders and saying you know whatever you know the um, brahmin rajput whatever leaders and saying uh, you people won't survive you will be at home washing clothes and uh, doing the dishes and uh, 
uh, your uh, you know the the women will be over here and uh, i will be happy because i am not going to get affected it's you guys who will be affected so i was pretty shocked by that because i said look we should be paying attention when this is happening over and over so you have to recognize misogyny also as one of the factors and i said look uh, reservation within reservation absolutely root for it and fight for it and have it but don't tell yourself that representation of women is necessarily out there to cancel representation of uh, other sections it doesn't quite work like that because as i i was going to say about jnu also see the speech thing was actually uh, yeah okay i mean kanaya great speaker and yes he uh, sort of broke through on his own but that was a rare occasion that much i can tell you in general for the last uh, at least more than a decade i would say since the early you know 2004 5 everybody who has been able to win elections there is someone who has been a you know most of them have been first time uh, you know higher education okay uh, not english speakers uh, sometimes not even first hindi speakers okay odia speaker somebody and they have mostly been from uh, dalit and extremely backward castes as well as obc castes so what that means that your uh, political <laughs> sphere has changed also on campuses and that was pre modi that was not post modi so i don't uh, credit all this to modi i think what Mo- modi has done is that he has been able to game this because it has stopped only at representation my point is if you don't think beyond representation see if it's only a question of how much am i represented okay yeah it also comes down to the question of uh, critical so, presence be- beyond representation you know yeah because presence and representing ideas not yeah. only representing yeah. uh, identities right so it has to be both because a uh, uh, liberation so ambedkar's why you know why he is uh, respected is not just because of his identity or the fact that he studied or whatever it's because he was a liberator you know and he his success as his failures they're all great because he his whole it was all in a in that spirit of liberating so my point is that where is that gone so i feel as though the politics of representation when it has stopped at representation it has not gone on to a, a, an anti caste politics in the sense that we have to challenge the language of uh, caste hierarchy so instead it reverted bsp that's why i mentioned that initially it was exciting till pretty late in the day also in the lower ranks of the bsp you had people fighting for unity with muslims and all pretty late in the day but it then reverted into thinking okay brahmins will have brahmin representation we'll have this thing sabka itna itna and it doesn't work like that because in you know uh the minute you do that it is the old uh, regime which is going to again triumph you know in that way and then representation becomes a representation of no representation of ideas at all so if the same person can happily move from bsp or samajwadi party to bjp fine no problem you know it's like uh, so that that i find uh, you know very disturbing and for me it's forget the party my feeling was the sh- the anger i feel when people who have come from representing uh, you know a, a better ideas and all of that they want a you know they have said we are for a better world and then uh, they say that okay we are uh, we are happy uh, you know hating on muslims that is where i feel is the bigger problem how can you be part of and that started in these nda coalitions throughout right where you started finding uh people willing to be part parties w- willing to be part of uh, coalitions with bjp and saying silly things like okay i won't be seen on the stage with modi because modi represents gujarat and vajpay is different i'm going to be with vajpay and all that was i think the problem and then they their argument was always i'm get being represented you're seeing a uh, you know a uh, dalit woman on on the stage as whatever so the point is yes it's wonderful to see a dalit woman it's wonderful to see you as a chief minister but why are you yeah, but, hitching your wagon to you know the the worst enemies of uh, these ideas so that is the thing right so on one side if you were to look at it from the point of view of the people who are the perpetual audience the kings are fighting the rest are watching so among the people who are watching they are being told when they are seeking representation that is this representation is this the kind of president you want to be is this the kind of chief minister you want to be uh, this is tokenistic and this this shears you of any kind of criticality that your identity brings into you that's one this thing on the other side you are talking about a, 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 a group of people who say that it is not the idea is important 
it is not who represents the idea right no, is this person uh, and, and this uh, huh. this this consistently comes up actually with all these savarna formations whether it's the congress whether it's the dravidian movement the communist which is that what that person is saying so what if that person is some brahmin but they're saying the right thing no no so that i totally agree with you about that i have no uh, debate whatsoever i think totally totally important that uh, you know it, that's no answer but my quarrel was with the first part mm. see my point is it's not about people being in the audience and saying okay uh, Uh, and being told you are having token representation there i don't think it's a question of token the point is where is the solidarity you are not mayavati was no token of she course, was no, no. A, a product of a movement she was a product of an amazing historic uh, point in india's political history and uh, but the point at which she began to make the alliances with so it's like you are asking questions about india to india saying do we have to put aside you know any idea of liberation for the uh, greater more revolutionary ideas for the present but that's what was done and my problem was not you can have all kinds of compromises that's fine but you threw muslims under the bus in so doing in up in a state like up that to me was where the problem comes in because i and i would say that to any party saying that whatever you represent okay you represented a section which was not yet uh you know not yet uh, included and that's great uh for that matter even the obc even lalu's own rise and all of that it was an amazingly exciting time quite frankly and he got the support of dalits he got the support of uh, all kinds of uh, ebcs yeah, everybody who comes to okay. power has to get the support no, of dalits he, he it wasn't just a question of coming to power it was sheer popularity you see people liked what he was saying and liked who he was both those things and which really you think mayavati kind of she also did did but also you said you said that she threw muslims under the bus in yes because if you align with bjp at a time when uh, literally like uh, muslims are being persecuted by the bjp which has happened every time the bjp has been in power i think that that is a betrayal so my no, point is that is where i'm talking about no but sure, you, sure. and i don't think that is a question of token my point is i think you're doing harm to your own political uh, presence and usp once you start doing that that is where i stand and uh, that's a fair point no so, because yeah. uh, so the thing is i mean the, what i was trying to take it towards mm. is to ask you to so now in this last segment what right. i want to do is look at things that complicate isms yes right uh, so uh, let's assume or let's say that uh, the dalit position from the point of view of the self interest of the most marginalized is organically most naturally secular and uh, not allying with the muslims defeats that secular uh, you know formation that idea that movement and all of that now uh, if you look at it slightly differently muslims and dalits have not had a very comfortable relationship and they are not the same their experience of marginality is not the same uh, one section has never experienced power and another section has experienced power and, and there's that caste in the muslims and, and there is all ca- of no that, that mm-hmm. caste among muslims and you know the thing is there is not as natural an alliance between dalits and muslims socially and in fact there is a greater so the criticism where it comes from is that there's a greater alliance between muslims and savarnas across time across history in south asia than there has been between dalits and muslims right so these kind of things where do you, where do you see the, how the, see, how do you see me, that playing out i think out? that's where i'll say again that even these isms and these assumptions which we have had so it's, uh, what i say for the left and for all the other isms i'll say for this also i think we are at a very different moment here and we should be thinking beyond what has been the historical experience alone okay we need to be thinking about but how do you bring them together how do you bring them together yeah, so, so how do you bring dalit as, muslim together yeah. so for in, i feel as though the 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 uh, the only way in which you can have real lasting change social political in india or anywhere is that uh, it has to be built on a sense of solidarity and solidarity is not condescension solidarity is not about sympathy solidarity is literally about saying i am experiencing oppression in this way i am experiencing exclusion or discrimination in this way you are also experiencing it in a different way maybe maybe even you have been part of excluding me and you know hating on me but uh what are the ways in which we can sit together argue fight it out but 
building an understanding based on the idea of where does our oppression what do we have in our suffering and oppression and what do we have common in our oppressor so i feel as though that and i don't just say it about dalits and muslims i say it up to muslims between dalits uh, and obcs no no i say it to muslims to dalits to women for instance about lgbt uh, sections i'm like yaar all of you all are talking about uh, you know um you know our autonomy our rights our dignity our humanity and human rights and constitution and all is fine the minute you say hello you know the constitutional right extends to the right of the uh, the the muslim man to be gay oh my god all the you know the, the twitter warriors who are representing you know uh, muslim identity uh, or claiming to be i see them as very poor the worst representatives of that again because the idea you're representing is totally horrible because you're literally saying no he can if he wants to be gay he can be gay or he can be gay but he should not practice being gay he should not be you know love he can be we are not saying we'll kill him but if he is a muslim he is not allowed to be gay so i am like this you know how can you voice this at one level while saying that as a muslim i have a right to live life in full the point is that is where i'm saying that that the understanding where uh, you're able to actually see a connection and be able to argue without uh, sectarian this exclusion seeing a connection we've co- in the past we've called it intersectionality for some reason that word has gone a little out of circulation uh but if you consider common ground right uh you have to co- also consider the fact that there are there's no competition among marginalities but there are competitive of course competing claims to marginality which places people at different points in the hierarchy finally it's about breaking hierarchies uh but these marginalities are not experienced the same way uh the muslim experience is not the same as uh dalit experience which is not the same as the experience of a woman of somebody who is el- from the lgbt yes, communities yes but can't we take the lesson from someone who is uh, from these ma- absolutely ma- so uh, let me tell you what i know you're itching to finish so maybe you finish no 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 i'm not itching, no no i'm not at all <laughs> so for that. instance when i saw the same sex uh, you know marriage what marriage equality debates in uh, court so i saw an essay by i think uh, a couple of tweets by dilip mandal and uh, i think Nit, um, uh, it was uh, uh, was it uh, nitin meshram nitin meshram so the a joint article so i remember uh, you know so the idea was that all this uh, marriage equality and all these are all savarna issues so he is quoting oh hari shayar wanted to marry only a brahmin so you know this term so i was like are you under the impression that there are no uh, dalit uh, gay people no dalit uh, lgbt people really so for me the point is that, that it's not a question of int- i don't i'll tell you why to me intersectionality as a word doesn't fully fit okay no it has not i mean it has in a way it has been discarded but nevertheless when we discarding. talk about these things I'll just of just tell you i have yeah. no word to replace yeah, it i'll yeah. just explain what i mean i feel as though it's the same body the same person okay the same person for me the person from whom i want to learn solidarity will be the dalit uh, you know uh, trans woman okay or the uh, dalit gay man okay and there are they are there around us they are there in the movements around us many of them are having to hide their identity in the movements we are calling democratic to me the day that they are able to break out of that and say all right here i am in this and i am able to lead while being my entire full self you know there they are so you don't have to think of this as uh, you know the the uh, gay uh, 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 fight uh, intersecting with the uh, you know anti communal intersecting with uh, caste intersecting with gender it's often in the same person let's just uh, give space you know all of us uh, actually say that all right they are the people we need to be learning from but that becomes difficult when we all identify with a particular uh, it's not just an ideologicalism but we put ourselves into boxes where we think okay this is what i am and this is what i believe and it's for life and i know that uh, i know that even i have been uh, guilty of that the minute you you do something you tend to cling to it harder and harder with, even with a mistake and you you're going to think you know that uh, I, i want to be right but i think the point is to let that go a little especially in the world we are living in now and say yeah. you know no, it's it's i don't know if it's as much about who being right or wrong as much as it is about that same thing which we talked about which is who gets to hold the mic who 
stands yes, yes. on but stage. But that goes inside a, these identities also. Of course. And when you are deciding in a maze of identities uh, as to who gets to hold the mic, who gets to shape the discourse around whose, ex- whose experience really embodies or rather is representative of a larger whole, how do we look at it from bottom up? Uh, when we get into these kind of questions, I want to ask you, how would you uh, say in this thing, place, say, a uh, poor Dalit man yeah. and a rich Brahmin man, let's say. Uh, or rather, sorry, uh, uh, the other way around. A rich Brahmin man, uh, a rich Dalit man and a poor Brahmin. Yeah. Okay, or a Dalit man and a Brahmin woman. Uh, there are different... Yes. The difference is over here, right? Huge differences. But I think that uh, that's where I think that the recognition of, uh, you know, that it's not all going to happen in a process where uh, everyone passes an exam or is correct, right? So I feel as though the rubbing up and the arguments are part of it, okay? People are going to say really, uh, you know, insensitive and rubbish things also, where they think that, oh, you know, I'm poor and so this guy, who is he to say he's oppressed? So I think, but... If I feel as though, uh, for me, the CA movement was a little, you know, exciting for this reason, that because so many kinds of people were coming under one, this thing, and I was, uh, I had the privilege of witnessing people who are not schooled in these arguments, sitting next to each other and then having to have those arguments. They haven't planned it, but it has happened. Okay. So I, you know, you're having Muslim women of a certain age sitting next to a young Muslim girl who is uh, wearing uh, sleeveless, another woman who is saying, I'm married. Who could be a member of AISA. And not just AISA, but just some random girl, okay, in Bihar, okay. Ah, Taking the mic, running that whole show, she's barely out of school. And uh, there she is, you know. So, uh, even with very, and people are having hundred discomforts there, but they are also, that discomfort is also battling with their admiration that, kya madhya kar rahi but the minute they sit down and ideas this thing, then they are have, they're bursting into fireworks. But I felt that those fireworks are great. So I feel as though the example you're giving me of the, uh, you know, someone who is, say, a, Bra- a, a Brahmin Dalit woman, IS, a Dalit man. A Dalit hmm. IS officer hmm. and, uh, you know, let's say a Brahmin uh, construction worker or something. His okay. driver is Brahmin, let's driver. say. Driver. So the point is that we, the the uh, the social, you know, about if, you, if we start looking at uh, simple measures of dignity, uh, the minute we discuss those, you will come to a point where... And then the point is not to say, oh, look, as a Brahmin, I'm poor and so. You are poor not because you're Brahmin, no. You are poor because uh, that's a different connection. You are you have in common your poverty with the poor Dalit, no? So that is the connection you have. And this guy will have to think about the connections he has with the other rich chaps, right? And he's going to have to decide, okay, where do where am I going to stand? Am I going to stand saying, I'm privileged and now I don't want to have anything to do? Or am I going to think about... So I feel as though that's why instead of thinking of, you know, who we don't have anything to do with and the little camps and gangs we can make, I feel as though the difficult job of trying to uh, think more about uh, what are the structures of oppression and how we can fight those and prejudice. And therefore, you should feel even if that guy is oppressing you, fight for their, uh, you know, uh, one more recommendation of a film which I love, which is a bit cheesy, but very, it was based on a real story. So Pride, no, I don't know if you've seen the film. It's a brilliant film about uh, a small group of uh, uh, lesbian and gay activists in London who during the mine workers strike in the 80s in uh, rural uh, UK, they decide to go collect money and give to this mine workers village. So, when they land up there and, uh, you know, the mine workers invite them without quite realizing that they are this group, they think. But when they get there, then of course, there's this enormous rural homophobia and all of that. But um, there's also other stuff, right? So, it's a very interesting story and it was based on a real, a real, a real incident. And the thing is that then the issues of how oppression is uh, lived and how different, you know, so someone who's better off who's living with his uh, boyfriend in a little flat in London, has a job. So he's going into a village where people literally are, can't earn because they're on strike and they're hungry. Okay. So, but those people are saying, Tu kaun hai be? <laughs> you are coming and you're, uh, you're degenerate, uh, this thing spreading, uh, this thing in my village. And that person has literally originally been from a village and is traumatized by the, he has run away to the city because the city is a place he can have a measure of privacy and uh, dignity. 
but then they really have and then of course eventually they realize that there are old men in the village who are gay okay and who are like okay now you know <laughs> nice so it, it is it's very very uh, i feel as the putting yourself in those positions you know saying that i will go and have these conversations these conversations okay so my final question is very hypothetical take your time to think about it i'm trying to paint a scenario yeah. there is a political problem at hand uh, a dalit man a brahmin woman uh, a muslim gay man and uh, that will be enough yeah. are in a room plotting revolution <laughs> <laughs> lovely <laughs> tell me what happens what's the conversation like yeah so yeah that's that's a that's a very interesting scenario to which so I dalit could man add several brahmin woman ha uh, theek hai uh, muslim gay yeah, man yeah so i think that you know the the idea is that uh, you know maybe they would start with talking about uh, where they are coming from and maybe they'll be very full of themselves so each may say that okay you know i have experienced all of this and my experience is actually worse than yours and in some level then it may be true when it comes to uh, some of them the thing is that it depends right if the brahmin woman says i was nearly burnt alive okay then the dalit the man may say well uh, i was nearly uh, you know lynched and killed or whatever you know these various things so so all uh, three have been threatened with life, lynching huh? life, so, the, so they experience. have a common thing over there they have then how do we move common. next uh, uh. but they may also have prejudices towards each other in common where they say that you know you guys always are like this and you don't really think so you are dalit but you identify as hindu and so you are not i'm not you know going to look at me the same way and the brahmin woman may say look when it comes to getting married no then i'll marry where my parents are telling me to marry so i'm like sorry revolution is not going to happen then you might as well throw away revolution but i think that the conversation may change if uh, you know uh, experience uh, tells them that okay may- maybe the three of us shouldn't plot in this room alone okay let's go and meet uh, you know people who are in a mixed community say but who are facing a similar similar so if it's a village which is facing eviction or something there are different communities of different uh, power equations there so let's go talk there and there you know if we take the responsibility that okay i'll go and talk to those who are not mine okay and with great respect saying i'm not here to tell you what to do i'm here so that i listen to what you're saying and then i only offer you what i understand from my experience let's see so i i have this i can say with my with my own experience that these are the m- the really uh, the con- the only conversations in which i start smelling faint smell of revolution okay somewhere otherwise sorry in rooms full of people who are very you know holding these meetings and making plans and what not no matter what the identities and how you know they may all be it doesn't work like that so actually when you're having an unschooled conversation with uh, people who are really thinking uh, you know and then when you start thinking about where so i feel as though if these people get out of that room but keep in touch they are friends they find that do they walk uh, out know, of the room as so friends so the brahmin room finds think? out yeah so i think that is that's a must so we sh- will tell them we'll lock you no, in the room until hypothetically do you imagine them walking out they won't out open the room till we <laughs> <laughs> till they walk out friends escape room scenario so pehle you make sure that you are willing to keep meeting and arguing okay that's a minimum i really otherwise this door is not opening yeah we are locking you so in so i wish we could do that to in the world today and the country today because i think that is one of the big problems because people are not willing to talk uh, you know they each are willing to live in their own world experience and that goes including for the secularists and all of that which i strongly feel even the best of us i think we find it so easy all of i i include myself in that hands up where it's so easy to say with despair that oh it's all hopeless and everybody is so you know uh, backward and so so prejudiced and all of that so uh, when i say that that this country is doomed and people have chosen this i am talking to others who feel like me okay and that doesn't mean just my caste identity or my gender identity or whatever it means people who think that they have a superior understanding of democracy and to just this morning i was trying to think to myself that yes i am confident that i do have a more a, democ- a more democratic position than someone who is prejudiced towards his muslim neighbor okay yes or somebody who thinks women should uh, you know be in, uh, behave in a certain way not marry outside the caste or what but i would say that so my argument with them is not that uh, my argument with them is that their idea is not democratic but in their own you know uh, if if 
if there were a quarrel in their own community if there was a proper debate there then the woman who's marrying will have something to say no she is also going to say hello okay and that has uh, you know that that the violence is also happening when that stuff begins happening so i was telling myself that okay i mean that's how maybe the democratic muscles will get stronger you know when we recognize that uh, you can respect the person you can say i don't think you're inferior because you have a horrible idea but your idea is dehumanizing and i'm going to keep talking to you about it i'm going to keep saying no i am confident my idea is democratic not because i am educated and i am i am from jnu or whatever <laughs> but because i am going to say because uh, my experience is this i know that i can show you other people who are experiencing oppression because of your idea so it's high time you stop thinking like that something like that <laughs> that's a lot thank you thank you that's a good yeah. conversation i hope i provoked you no, no, absolutely um, you did and uh, yeah i hope this conversation gave you something to think about I'll be back with another provocative thinker in the next episode of What's Your Ism. The news minute and this show reaches people because of people like you. It's ironic that outlets with cash aren't invested in their journalism and those who are invested in their journalism just don't have the cash. You can help change that one subscription at a time. Become a TNM member.